for the pleasure. Thank you very much. Our first guest speaker this evening is Barbara Cade. Most of us will know her regular column in the National Post, where she's been writing since 2003. In addition, she's been a regular contributor to Pajamas Media and Mercator on Net. If you're not familiar with those, I'd encourage you to Google them and find them and look at them as online publications. Great information and research and writing on there as well. Her regular thread through her writing is a commentary on cultural observations and their impacts on Canada today. A committed supporter of the family, in particular her family. Please welcome one of my favorite columnists, Barbara Kate. our government and uh, uh, our guests and thank you very much Dave for the uh, uh, for the honor of in inviting me here uh, for an institute whose work I, I deeply respect. Um, I'll, I'll speak a little bit quickly because I know I have a very serious time limit and uh, quite a bit to say. Uh, when I began my weekly sojourn with the Post in 2003 I, I had no particular niche subjects. Uh, my general curiosity lay in social trends and the factors that contribute to building and maintaining a healthy, stable society. But so many of the negative cultural trends I was drawn to for column fodder uh, kept leading me back to the same source. The Marxist uh, political theorist Antonio Gramsci famously spoke of the, quote, long march through the institutions as the path to cultural hegemony. And as I began to look at the, inst uh, the institutions that instruct our children, mold our lawyers and social workers and psychologists, sensitize our judiciary, uh, shape the views of our journalists and inspire our future politicians, it became clear to me that the custodians of these institutions were all drinking from the same ideological well, Marxist imbued feminism. Feminism was the best organized and militant of the new isms uh, that were considered de rigueur uh, amongst the cultures bien pensant, but it has been powerless to compensate for the unhappiness it has been the primary culprit in creating. As respected gender wars critic Christina Hoff uh, Summers argues in an essay on feminism in a new book, Liberty and Civilization, the Western Heritage, edited by Roger Scruton, radical feminists produced a form of women's liberation that, quote, has little to do with liberty since it aims not to free women to pursue their own interests and in inclinations, but rather to re-educate them to attitudes often profoundly contrary to their natures. Fault-free divorce, transient common law partnerships accorded the same respect and benefits as marriage, gay unions uh, equated to marriage, the exaltation of single motherhood and the discreditation of fatherhood guilt-free, convenience-motivated abortion on a mass scale, transgressive sexuality celebrated for its own sake, and the early sexualization of children, all these factors can in part or whole be attributed to feminism, which is in its essence, like many ideologies, a conspiracy theory that inspires militancy in its recruits by scapegoating heterosexual men. It is the only conspiracy theory that has accorded respectable status in our society. In the last 10 or 15 years, uh, we have seen downward rates of crime, divorce, illegitimacy, drug and alcohol abuse, and early sexual activity, which is good. Our culture has shifted notably rightward. Bourgeois values are once again in vogue, and families have once again become the center of our cultural focus. People do sense that too many babies were thrown out with the bathwater of women's real grievances. Um, and here I think uh, a quote that is apt would be uh, Norman Podhoretz, the neoconservative writer, who said, there can be no more radical refusal of self-acceptance than the repudiation of one's own biological nature. And I think that this is an understanding that is coming back uh, to women's realization. In the last, uh, uh, sorry, so there is reason for optimism. Uh, today, 40 years on, women's studies classes are emptying out. Uh, few women today identify themselves as ideological feminists. Educated, middle-class women 
once the mainstay of the feminist movement realize that they have been somewhat bamboozled. They actually want husbands and children, and they do not want to feel guilty about that. Uh, as a recent survey makes clear uh, here in Canada, women, given the choice, would stay home with their children in their earliest years. As the ecologists like to say, nature bats last. Um, I see the re bourgeoisification, uh, if you like, in my own children's milieu. Who, they're, they're young and married, and well, youngish and married, and, and they both have uh, children of their own. Uh, and their milieu is highly educated young people who are making their way in life quite successfully. Uh, my daughter works for the federal government. She could easily have moved up to a higher echelon by now, but it would have meant giving up her coveted classification of teleworker, which permits her to work out of her Montreal home office. She has a nanny, the nanny looks after her two children, but knowing that she is available when necessary is far more important to her than more money or higher status, at least while her children are young. I think a generation ago, women like her would have felt very guilty for stepping off the treadmill. Amongst couples, uh, like my daughter and her husband and her peers, uh, marriage, I would say, is actually in very good shape. According to Kay Heimowitz, North America's premier observer of mores and cultural values around the institution of marriage, this is, quote, a moment of tremendous promise for Americans, and I think she would include Canadians if she thought about it, or at least for those with a cultural memory to benefit from following what she calls the life script that leads out of poverty and into mature, successful adulthood. Finish school, get a job that leads somewhere, then get married, and then have children. It's an easy script to follow. Amazing, so few people do. Unfortunately, there is a whole underclass, so many generations removed from the formula that they have lost even the memory, let alone the motivation to repair the damage that has been done to them by elites who believed that theory can trump human nature. The same elites who followed the script themselves. They got married, they got jobs, they had children after they were married, but they told all the other women that they didn't have to do that and they could still have a good life. In 1965, 25% of African American babies were born to unwed mothers. Today it is 70%, but amongst highly educated people, uh, like my kids and I'm sure yours, only 6% of babies are born to unwed mothers, quite a disparity. In between the two groups, uh, a new poll or new study that I've seen out of uh, the United States, interesting, interestingly, is that somewhat educated people are losing their grip on marriage and, and that whole sort of blue collar crowd that used to be the mainstay of uh, marriage and family, uh, they're slipping. It's, it's really the, the cultural elites that are uh, very, very strong on the marriage front. Speaking, and, and who are having babies after they're married. Um, speaking of the birth of babies, it is thanks to feminism that infertility clinics are doing such a landslide business. Uh, I gave a few talk, uh, a talk a few years ago to the McGill Women's Alumni Association on feminism and its effects. Some young women were in the audience and I noticed that one was visibly startled when I mentioned the statistics around the optimal breeding years for, for women. I said that women are most fertile between the ages of 15 and 25, that the odds of a successful pregnancy and uncomplicated birth decline markedly after the age of 30, and that by 35, one was really gambling. Uh, by 40, the chances of an easy conception and healthy full-term birth are the gestational equivalent of Russian roulette. But this young woman told me that even though she was in women's studies, where theoretically one learns a lot about, uh, you know, women, um, <laughs> nobody had ever told her that she might have trouble having children if she delayed starting a family. Teachers don't tell them, doctors are afraid to, lest they appear sexist, and so young women have come to believe that getting pregnant later in life may simply require a little technological help. But they look at all the Hollywood stars getting pregnant and figure no big deal. But it is because even IVF, uh, you know, technological help, has less than a 30% chance of success. I have seen so much anguish amongst my children's friends' late onset first pregnancy. Many have failed to conceive, then many have failed to carry. 
uh, some are very dependent on drugs and technological aids. The years of obsession that stripped the joy from life in their best years, and to know that a whole generation of young women have been sold a bill of goods that can be t traced directly to one ideological source. Um, the, the, the days of radical feminism are over, but the effects linger on. Uh, the great triumph of feminism is the trickle-down effect of their most damaging notions. The entire liberal establishment, notably the media, treat feminins, feminism's antisocial nostrums as received wisdom. A uh, year or so ago, I wrote a column about uh, castigating uh, a journalist, a well-known journalist, Katrina Onstad, at the time a columnist for Chatelaine, the most read women's magazine in Canada with, with circulation in the millions, because she blindly infor informed us in one of her monthly op-eds op that she wanted her daughter to taste life to the full before settling down and therefore would advise her not to even think of getting pregnant, no mention of marriage, uh, before, they were, before she was 35. Well, thanks, Mom. You know, glad you had kids. How about ensuring we get our best shot, too? That was a very damaging thing for her to do because she spread a false notion. Never before have we lived in a society where the best interests and the pleasures of women have trumped the best interests of children and family. The first time in history. The failure of ideologues to pay nature its due, to recognize that biology is to a great extent destiny, has entrenched fear and suspicion of men in many young women and has alienated many men. Uh, as conservative writer Midge Dechter wrote at the height of the feminist revolution, relations between men and women are ghastly. The men feel downgraded and sapped and rendered impotent by the women. Young women today are suffering very much from the absence of men who have faith in themselves. Men's faith in themselves has been further undermined by a family law system that systematically downgrades their importance to children uh, and reflexively privileges sometimes demonstrably unfit mothers' rights to their children as inherent, but regards fathers' rights to their children as contingent on their worthiness to parent, such worthiness to be determined by the state. As former Justice Minister Martin Cochon once said, men have no rights, only responsibilities. This does not bode well for the future. You can't go home again. Even if the ideology of feminism were to disappear tomorrow, our culture has been irreversibly changed. Not altogether for the bad, by the way. But still, our concern here is marriage and family. A few months ago, I was speaking to a group of Catholic students at Ryerson University in Toronto. Afterward, uh, a young woman approached me seeking advice. She is a devout Catholic who has high career ambitions but she's also eager to marry and have a large family. She's already 25 years old. Uh, as I wrote in a column, uh, this conversation, the conversation sparked me to further thinking about it, and I, I wrote in my column, what advice can I give Andrea? It's not her real name, but I called her that. I was probably thinking of Andrea Bruce, like, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I'd really like to find somebody for Andrea, by the way. She's a terrific young woman. <laughs> I'm a, I'm, a born, I'm a born matchmaker, and I'd really like to find, she's a fabulous young woman, okay. So what, what advice, and, and, and so what advice could I give this beautiful, equally, equally beautiful and talented and, and, and uh, adorable young woman? Well, what, what was I supposed to say to her? Stop studying, find Mr. Wright and start procreating? After all, Canada needs lots more loved children, and her children would be blessed. On the other hand, this young woman is a winner, and I want to see her succeed. Unusually for me, I have no advice to offer Andrea. Gallup Research has been polling Americans for decades on their what's called aspirational fertility. How many kids people say that they want? Because it is the best predictor of how many children they will actually have. The bright line between wanting three children maximum and wanting more than three is active religious participation. So, that means regular church's attendance is how they judge that. Andrea validates that profile. Her aspirational fertility is five children, and she is a committed Catholic. But how many Andreas are out there? I look back at my own choices made a half a century ago, uh, ago when women were beginning to be highly educated, and I can see 
that no rational collective argument could have persuaded me not to have any children, but at the same time, no rational collective argument could have persuaded me to have many children. Autocratic governments can make children have fewer, uh, can make people have fewer children, but they can't make people have more. Singapore tried. Uh, while modernizing in the 1960s after gaining independence from the British, Singapore's newly minted Family Planning and Population Board launched a billboard campaign messaging stop at two and small families, brighter future. Abortion and sterilization were encouraged at the government's expense. Maternity leave was denied after two children. It worked. Uh, Singapore reached its fertility rate target of 2.1 in 1976, a 53% plunge in just a decade, but it didn't stop declining as women's education rates went up. A reverse strategy was implemented. Abortion wasn't banned, but pre-op counseling is now required for women with three or fewer children. The billboard and media messaging was changed to have three or more children if you can, but no dice. Singapore's fertility rate in 1960 was 5.45. Today, it is 1.1. Canada's total fertility rate is presently 1.6, far below replacement. I have a feeling uh, Andrea will realize her difficult hybrid goal, whatever the obstacles, but in our secularized society, uh, such women are few and far between. So it seems mass immigration from countries where women are not yet highly educated must be our portion for the foreseeable future. And when they are educated, what then? So I'm just here to pose the questions, not to uh, give the answers, thank goodness. Um, and thank you for your... We didn't set that up. I, I didn't know what Barbara was going to say, but she actually had two commercials for us in there. One was her, one of our speakers at our last conference, Kate Heimowitz, and the uh, the next conference is uh, going to highlight Brad Wilcox, who I think is the author of the study that uh, Barbara mentioned in there as well. So if the first conference you, or the last conference you missed, but you're intrigued by that, please come out and see us May 5th. A little infomercial right there for you. One of the